And uh, with, with, with identifying sort of what I do in terms of research and teaching, urban metabolism is a, a pretty cool topic because it tries to bring one analogy of cities in understanding um, uh, a profile for cities and trying to quantify sustainability. And so urban metabolism uh, is an analogy with the human body, like human metabolism. And some people have faster or slower metabolism depending on uh, their fitness level and health and age, et cetera. And so it tries to mimic the urban setting like the human body, it needs, it, it needs inputs. Uh, there are digestive processes that happen and then there is waste. The same applies to cities. There's a lot of raw materials and energy that is used for inputs into all the activities that take place in cities, whether it's construction, uh, whether it's uh, provision of energy and water services for the residents. And then there is waste that's produced in terms of emissions and effluents, et cetera. So the definition of urban metabolism is the sum total of all the technical and socioeconomic processes that occur in cities and that result in growth, production of energy and elimination of waste. So from that perspective, the origins of, these, of this word, urban metabolism, started in 1965 by a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He's a, his name is Abel Woolman and uh, he was a professor of sanitary engineering. I don't think we call that anymore, but it's more like wastewater engineering today. And he was concerned about air and water pollution and wanted to be able to quantify just how much pollution there is in a, as a way to try to find solutions uh, for his concerns. And he developed that urban metabolism concept. Now, what this concept starts with is a hypothetical study of an American city with a population of 1 million. So it is hypothetical in a sense, but trying to determine the amount of inputs and outputs into this city of 1 million people. And so um, recognizing this is done in the 1960s and I've tried to keep the images the way they were produced in his paper and not to try to sort of update those images to give a sense of what it was like doing an urban metabolism study for the very first time. The inflows into this hypothetical city is our inflows of water and food and fuel. And you can see the units here are in times per day. And these grids or these blocks represent the magnitude of uh, water inputs and food and fuel. You'll see that the fuel is predominantly fossil fuels and that's in the 1960s. So coal, oil, natural gas and motor fuels. We have changed a little bit since this scenario of energy supply, but not too much. We are still pretty much uh, dependent on a lot of the fossil fuels today. In terms of outflows, what comes out of the cities at the other end, uh, again, a quantification for that hypothetical city shows sewage and refuse, and uh, so refuse is just garbage, and the suspended solids in the sewage, and at the very bottom here are the air pollutants that are quantified. So it gives a sense of just how much of this kind of pollution coming, uh, resulting from 1 million people. So taking that, this approach just a little step further is an industrial ecology approach that was uh, in the, around the 1960s by Herbert Girardet, who was an ecologist and a consultant to the United Nations Environment Program and the, United, uh, and the UN Habitat. And he was also a co-founder of uh, the World Future Council. And he took this urban metabolism approach one step forward and added to it the conversion of nature into society. So not only looking at inputs and outputs, but trying to see the impact on nature because our inputs all come from nature and the outputs are outputs that impact how nature really performs. And he's got many books, I've just listed a few here. And so the linear metabolism is looking at metabolism in a very linear perspective. You've got inputs, you've got the city in the middle, uh, doing all sorts of processes and activities, and you've got outputs. And it's considered linear because it's a very urban world process. Inputs, outputs, nature doesn't really behave that way. But this is what it looks like if it's a linear process. Now, circular metabolism tries to tap into uh, sort of some of the circular economy principles where you've got the same inputs and outputs, recognizing this output arrow is much reduced from a linear uh, metabolism flow but then much of the outputs are actually cycled back into as inputs. And so in a circular cycle, there's usually very little waste 
and almost everything is reused. And it, this, in, in this fashion, it tries to uh, mimic a natural world process. This is how nature behaves, and that's why nature is sustainable if we don't disrupt that cycle. So material flow analysis is usually what is used to try to quantify these arrows representing the inputs, the outputs. And for the urban setting, it's really limited to these four key resources, energy and water and materials used for construction and nutrients, which is, which is food that serves the, the population of cities. And just limiting it to those four gives a pretty good picture and tells a pretty good story of what goes on in cities. And uh, taking those material flows and looking at some of the resource inputs and some of the waste outputs, still going back to that first urban metabolism study, this one is a little bit more extended in that it also tries to track some of the livability indices. These are not nicely quantified the way energy or water is quantified. It tries to track things like health and employment, income, education, accessibility, community. And it's very hard to quantify that, but the more we can add to this model, the better it could be. Only sometimes that also means introducing uh, some uncertainties as well. Uh, so the metabolism of the anthroposphere is taking that even uh, sort of even broader and looking at sort of a bird's eye view, 30,000 feet uh, above at the whole urban metabolism concept. And it's really looking at the whole anthroposphere. And uh, this is by Bacchini and Brenner. They had an initial version in the 1990s and a more updated version in, 2020, uh, in 2012 but really looking at all the human influences, which is the anthroposphere. So let me share with you uh, some urban metabolism uh, diagrams and studies. I started off with Miami, just closer to where you are first, and uh, some historical uh, images, but also I have an attempt by some of my students to do urban metabolism diagrams for cities they were either interested in or born in, born in or um, where they would like to retire. At least that was the exercise. So in Miami here, this was uh, published in the 1970s. You can see that they've plotted uh, natural energies like rain and sun and wind. They've plotted some um, uh, energy and goods here. And you can also see there's inputs, money inputs. So this is tracking of uh, monetary flows, but also there's outputs here. So you can see the application of urban metabolism for Miami. And in the center, this is all the activities that take place in cities. Well, in the, in the specific case, Miami. And in Tokyo, uh, a little bit more abstract, but generally the same concept of showing inputs of the atmosphere, transportation and water and traffic. And you've got outputs as well. What remains within, in the center of the city, if it doesn't come out, then it is deposited. And that is the accumulation of waste. And so again, Tokyo is in the 1970s. And this is Brussels and it's in French, but it is considered one of the more detailed ones in the 1970s showing a lot of the energy with solar energy being the ultimate source of energy and showing a lot of the outputs. But you can start to see a little bit of cyclical activity happening and trying to see some of the waste as uh, useful raw material in other processes. And this is Paris. I thought this was also an interesting one. So this is published in the 1970s, but this captures data from 19th century uh, Paris. And you can see here inputs of water and wind and sun and fiber and food, monetary market dollars over here as well. What's interesting here is that the activities within the city of Paris shows horses. And, um, and I just wanted to say, well, horses, and you'd think, why, are, why on earth are they plotting horses here? But if you remember that this is 19th century Paris, this is the form of transportation then. So it is still plotting the buildings and the assets and transportation. And here's Hong Kong, more, uh, more abstract in the sense of um, sort of just listing, but the listing is pretty elaborate because now it's pulling from some databases to really uh, show the details of what kind of waste is being produced or what kind of materials are being sourced for the construction activities uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, so here's, here's sort of my version of a simplified urban metabolism approach. 
and I ask my students to do the same, and perhaps you'd be willing to explore this exercise for your own cities, is to try to track the four key resources for material flow analysis, which is energy, water, materials, and nutrients, and try to plot at least these three outputs of air emissions, wastewater, and waste. And within the city, try to find some efficiencies and try to leverage some of the innovation that can turn these linear flows into more cyclical flows. So the idea is to try to reduce the inputs, to try to reuse the outputs, and within the city, try to introduce efficiencies in the processes. So here's uh, some of the outputs from uh, fourth year undergraduate students that uh, were taking a course that I was teaching called, sustain uh, called Infrastructure for Sustainable Cities, and they look at cities uh, globally. And uh, this pair chose Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and tried to map out the existing conditions. So a future exercise was then to take the existing urban metabolism and try to see what it would be like in 2050 once, you, once they've accommodated for population growth and try to introduce some innovations in turning them into more cyclical flows. This one here is Rio de Janeiro, again, by another uh, couple uh, that worked as a team to do that. And you can see here the uh, variety of detail in terms of the input. And they all know if you have data, we've got good research. This is Kuala Lumpur here, and uh, some are more artistic than others, some are more creative than others in putting it together, but again gives the sense of the inputs and the outputs into a city. And Detroit, uh, very flowchart-like in terms of the arrows. So you'll see very little um, cyclical flows because these were considered existing conditions, and the challenge was to try to turn them into uh, a circular economy kind of flow. All right, and I think this is the last one for Atlanta, okay? And um, the magnitudes is, is really what's important to note, but we don't necessarily need to get into the numbers right now. So I thought I'd, um, after sharing some global cities, I thought I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of slides here to uh, highlight some of, the, some of the excitement around cities, particularly when they start growing in size and in scale. So part of the work that I've been doing, and it started at the University of Toronto, just as I was wrapping up and making my move to the University of Waterloo, is urbanization and megacities. And so in the 1970s, there was about three megacities globally. And megacities are really defined as cities that have populations of 10 million and more. And they tend to behave a little differently once they reach that 10 million threshold, because, because people in cities behave more uh, like a um, like a commuter shed, analogous to a watershed, where when there's precipitation, the water kind of gathers in the watershed. Uh, people commuting in and out of cities when they're 10 million and more treat that city in a similar fashion by coming into the city by day from neighboring cities, depending on good transportation systems, and they leave the city in the evening. Maybe maybe life looks a little different in this COVID era but at least that's the general behavior of megacities. In 2010, there was about um, uh, 20, uh, 25 megacities. And then in 2050, that's expected to reach a total of 36 megacities. So by the time we did a study of the megacities and tried to assess the sustainability in these regions, we were doing it around 2012 and we had captured about a little over 25, so precisely 27. And our findings, uh, were published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it really shows that out of the 27 megacities, and we were able to reach all 27, that the megacity population globally is about 6.7%. That's how much, uh, how many people live in megacities globally. But if you compare uh, that to the GDP and waste and other metrics in cities, you'll see that cities punch above their weight when it comes to the GDP. So you can see a GDP growth here of, sorry, not growth, a GDP contribution of 14.6%. In terms of waste disposal, when unfortunately that's also more than what they should be producing, gasoline consumption, predominantly vehicles, 9.9%, again, more than their fair share of their population globally. And electricity use is no different. Where there is a slight positivity in terms of the benefits and the sustainability assessment of megacities is really when it comes to energy use, so anything other than electricity, and that's primarily used for, uh, for heating, 
uh, of these cities and water use. So you can see energy use is about 6.7%, more of an equitable distrib distribution compared to population and water use, which is at 3%. So what this tells us is that when cities really grow in size and they become very dense and they've got populations of 10 million and more, water consumption is actually most sustainable because of the distribution networks, because of the efficiencies that could be introduced, introduced there to try to provide water to all the residents of a very densely populated megacity. And, uh, and lastly, uh, growing a bit further than 10 million is uh, as a work that I've been uh, doing and currently ongoing is the sustainability assessment of mega regions. And we don't have a definition of mega regions. The most uh, scientific, well, non-scientific approach right now is to really look at an image uh, from Earth, uh, of Earth at night and where we see there is a concentration of light that's where we have an indication that there's not just one city, but a group of cities uh, that show a lot of activity taking place. Uh, this particular study is funded by the Council of the Great Lakes Region, uh, which is an organization that brings the Canada and the US together. And so one of the mega regions there is, uh, for example, uh, Bosniwash, Boston, New York, and Washington together they behave more than just individual cities, but a collection of cities. There's many of those as well. There's the Pearl River in China, that mega region. There's a mega region in the uh, Western coast of Africa. There's also a mega region in Europe uh, that combines uh, Amsterdam, Brussels, and Antwerp, and it is named Ambrustwerp. Maybe not the easiest to say, but some groupings of mega regions. And that's what we're trying to define. If we can have a methodology by which we can identify these mega regions, whether they come together because of trade or whether they come together because of transportation corridors. Uh, I know the Mumbai Delhi mega region in India exists because of that Mumbai India industrial corridor. There's various reasons why cities come together to, to work together. And uh, we're trying to do a sustainability assessment because if the 50 largest cities of the world contribute so much to economic growth, and if these mega regions, if we can define them and quantify just how many there are, if they get sustainability right, I think globally, it would have an impact on the sustainability of our world uh, overall. Uh, so I'll leave you with this quote. Uh, it's by uh, one of my favorite people, but not everybody's favorite person, Greta Thunberg. Uh, who talks about looking at sustainability as cathedral thinking. And the quote I'll leave you with is, it will take a far-reaching vision, it will take courage, it will take fierce, fierce determination to act now, to lay the foundations where we may not know all the details about how to shape the sea link. In other words, it will take cathedral thinking. So sort of encouraging engineers and others alike to take a global view, to take a systems view of cities because it's all interconnected together. It all ties into one another. Uh, we are not bricklayers looking at it piece by piece, but rather looking at it uh, as cathedral thinking. And uh, uh, to tie it to uh, students who are in attendance or others who work with engineers and others of 2050, uh, this is part of a uh, word cloud pulling some of the attendees at the Canadian Engineering Education Association to ask, what do you think should be the skills that engineers should have in the future to be able to um, uh, live through all the storms that we will, uh, we will encounter, whether it's COVID or other crises. And what's highlighted here uh, are some of the words and the bigger ones imply that they were um, mentioned more than once by the participants. So you can see here interdisciplinary or education, problem, knowledge, policy, society. And so it's not really about the technical knowledge. It's now going beyond that to bring in knowledge of other disciplines, recognizing that that's going to be the way to move forward for the prosperity of our cities. And so I ask you to put on a sustainability lens when you uh, take a look at cities. There's so many ways to slice and dice uh, our approach in, in viewing cities. Uh, economics is one of them, looking at the economy of cities, but also looking at the sustainability, sustainability um, and how cities are performing in that regard. 
And uh, I'll end just with my contact information and would welcome anybody that would like to reach out and happy to have further conversations around the sustainability of cities. So I'll end it there. And uh, thank you once again for listening. And I haven't been keeping an eye on the chat if any are coming through, but uh, I can take a look now. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them or, or even starting a discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. That was a fascinating talk and um, really very informative. And I'm sure, like myself, the students have been um, very excited about this. We learn about sustainability and that's what I, this class is all about, trying to um, think about sustainability in every aspect of whatever we're going to do in, the, in their future career. Um, so I like the idea of the sustainability lens and how to become a sustainable, an agent of change, if you will. Um, but now I think we'll take questions from um, students first, and then we'll go to uh, people online. Any questions? Alexis, can you come here, please? So Alexis Smith, she has a question. Hi, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, I had a quick question. You talked about how cities take up 3% of Earth's land, but 60 to 80% of energy uses. Are you thinking we're seeing that due to the population that lives there or to like the corporations and things that are urbanizing and building in that area? Good question. Uh, you know what, believe it or not, it's actually easy to identify the borders of countries because they've got clear borders. It's not as easy to see the borders of cities to see exactly what we're counting because the borders of cities are a little bit more fluid, but it includes the residential homes and therefore the people that live in cities, but also the industrial and commercial activities that take place in cities. So sometimes most industrial activities are located outside the boundaries of cities. Uh, sometimes closer to water bodies for water access and for disposal. So most often it's not located within city boundaries, these commercial and industrial activities, but sometimes they are, and therefore they will count in terms of what they produce and consume. Uh, it, that will count for the city that they're counting it for. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Thanks, Nadine. Any other questions? SDG question. So there was a question online. Um, so Andy, he says that his hometown, St. Louis Park, Minnesota uses GIS to quantify solar energy potential in the community. Have you seen GIS used to quantify opportunities for sustainable city growth in your work? Mm, yes, interesting. Um, Using GIS to quantify social, uh, sorry, uh, solar energy, I think is amazing. I mean, I'm aware of a solar atlas and a wind atlas, but these are very uh, large scale atlases and sometimes bringing it down to a neighborhood and a community level is really what makes the data useful. Um, for GIS, I actually have a grad student uh, not in the School of Environment, uh, not in the School of Engineering rather, but in the School of Environment that was interested in work on the weight of cities. And the concept of the weight of cities uh, was, uh, is used by the United Nations uh, Development Program and the World Bank. And it literally is what it means to try to quantify just the, the weight of the construction materials in cities. And so um, her name's Ida and she used GIS to try to map out uh, where the roads are located where the buildings are located and try to see some of the vintage or how old the buildings are so that we can get a little bit of insight onto what kind of materials because the materials used in the 1960s are very different than the materials used today. And this was all mapped on GIS for lack of having sort of a good data set in the municipality as she kind of pieced her own pieces of information together with all the challenges of stitching that data together to get a good profile of the cities. But that was such a wonderful effort of, uh, of using GIS to try to quantify and have a look to see where the buildings and where the roads are located. And she did that for the Kitchener Waterloo area and that was actually recently published in January this year. And, um, if you're interested in GIS applications, I'll, I'm happy to forward that over 
uh, to Professor Sayed for her to forward it over to you. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Thank Andy. Um, a question from James or Lily James. Um, how is the spread of disease impacted by the high concentrations of populations in mega city affect efficiency? How do they mm -hmm. affect efficiency? Um, I would love to say that I could speak about public health and its interactions with cities. And I, I don't think I'm the best person to address that, but I'm going to take a stab at that. And I think it's on everybody's minds, uh, especially if we're talking disease, if, especially if we're talking about COVID and how that is magnified in cities where there's a lot of interaction or cities that can't afford to have lockdowns or cities that can't afford to have in their city designs this physical distancing requirement that's required. Um, uh, and, and of course, it, it, it's political will to do these kind of measures which are damaging in terms of um, the economies of these cities. But, um, but I will say that these diseases and having people locked in their homes has actually been beneficial for climate change or air quality uh, generally, but there's only so much that we can take with us as we go forward into a new norm to see some of the benefits that came about because we weren't using as much transportation and cars, we were working from home and doing things from home. So I find that uh, this crisis has showed us one thing, but we don't know what the next crisis will be. And the next crisis might not be a pandemic, but it might be something that has uh, conflicting requirements. For example, if we run out of power in a cold country such as Canada and we need to stay warm, well, the requirement there will be the opposite of social distancing or physical distancing. It's going to be a requirement where we come together in heating centers. And how do we reconcile sort of the future scenarios that we might encounter when they've got these uh, different, um, different scenarios that we might be faced with? So I know, I know for sure I did not address your question directly, but I hope I offer some insight into just our, the impacts of these diseases on, on urban design. Yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's still ongoing project. You know, it's um, effect, effect of COVID-19 on air quality. That's something that we're working on in my research group and seeing how it impacts different parts of the world in different cities. And it's really different everywhere the environments and the atmosphere is, behaves differently. Chemistry is different. And socially and economically, <laughs> there is a different uh, uh, behavior as well. Mark Compier, he says, um, he finds it difficult to convey perspective to people not familiar with new sustainable technologies, such as electric cars. Uh, what metrics or conversation topics have you discovered that helps people easily gain perspective? The sustainability community needs an easy way to help people gain perspective. Um, thanks, Mark, for that. Uh, I think this is a sort of a question that uh, requires uh, perspective on you know, how we see things. And when we talk about sustainability, there's probably as many definitions of sustainability as there are people that you would ask. And everybody has a different perspective. Everybody has a different opinion about it. It seems like not to be a fact. Um, even a lot of the things that maybe as an academic community we may take for granted because we would accept it, they're, they're more than just us that are, that are still debating climate change or the benefits of certain technologies. So when it comes to electric vehicles, for example, um, it really depends how we look at it. If you compare it to cars, well, absolutely an electric vehicle would be beneficial because it doesn't use gasoline. But you know what would make it equally as bad? If we take a life cycle perspective of, uh, of that electric vehicle, are we really looking at the point at which we have it in our, in our driveways? Or are we literally looking beyond that to see, well, how is the material sourced? Where is this electricity coming from? In Ontario, we've got six grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That's one of the cleanest measures around the world when it comes to uh, electricity, uh, the, the cleanliness of the electricity supply. Other countries, for example, I'll take Egypt, for example, or India, they're, they're very big on trying to introduce electric vehicles, but guess what? 100% coal fired electricity in these countries. They're actually better off using gasoline than they are using electric vehicles because that's the, that's sort of the measure of the um, electricity intensity of their power supply. 
So sometimes gaining perspective, I find that cities can learn from one another. If they have metrics that are comparable, if we can compare apples to apples and we see some best practices in some cities, of course, context matters. But that's one way of seeing that it's worked in this place, it's worked in this social setting or this economic setting. Here's how it could be tweaked in another part of the world. And surprisingly, some of the indigenous communities in Canada, far north, they have very little access to water and energy, very dire living conditions. You know who they are learning from? A lot of the African cities. Who would have known that uh, communities in African cities can share some of their best practices with indigenous communities in Canada because the challenges are the same, despite climate conditions being very different. I really like that. And I like the, the fact of thinking life cycle analysis. It's something that we, we talk about here in class, cradle to cradle and circular um, economies or circular uh, development. So it, it's not just pointing on one process and saying it's, it's sustainable or not. It's really a bigger picture. Um, Absolutely. Yes. And thanks, James and Mark, for these questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim, for uh, a fascinating talk. I'm sorry about the technical uh, difficulty. It shows that there, there's, there was a lot of interest in today's talk, in your talk, uh, and I haven't experienced this number before, <laughs> apparently. Uh, thank you so much. Really delighted to have you, and thanks for answering the, the questions. Um, there's so much that we need to talk about. So hopefully when, when it's all said and done with COVID, um, uh, you'll come visit and we'll have longer talks about SDGs and the pin that you're wearing um, and learn about you know, how do you address the, the United Nations SDG 11. Wonderful. Thank you. I am very grateful to have had the opportunity to speak to the class and to uh, uh, set foot in Florida until I can uh, come visit for myself. Thank you so well, much. Yes, you're always welcome. You know that. Um, so on behalf of my students, thank you very much. Wonderful. And talk to you soon. All right. Thank, thank everybody you. online. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.